Okay, so this is part two of the evolution video. In this, we're going to be talking a lot more about um, the factors that affect evolution, environmental stress. We'll talk about extinction, and we'll delve deeper into the concept of speciation, how new species actually evolve. So let's start off talking about environmental stress. Now, global climate change affects entire ecosystems. And this will alter the habitats and the niches that are available. Now, this means that some alleles which code for particular traits, will therefore become much more common in a population as others fade away. So this is a change in selection pressures that are occurring. Climate change might include uh, drought, flood, temperature and humidity changes. So all these selection pressures are changing and that will uh, change what we call the allele frequency in a population. An example of this is the pitcher plant mosquito. Now this mosquito's phenotype uh, is actually changed in line with changing temperatures. It normally spends the winters hibernating, but it's now much more active uh, later in the year. Um, they respond to day length, which triggers dormancy. So because it's getting warmer uh, and the climate's changing, um, it's actually changed the actual allele frequency um, uh, because of these longer periods of activity as the global, global climate uh, warms up. There's a few other examples, things like uh, corals, coral bleaching, the higher temperatures cause corals to bleach. This is an example of directional selection. Uh, it's occurring to favor the corals which can tolerate higher temperatures. So in terms of the variation of corals, you've got some that can tolerate the normal temperature, a few that can tolerate high and a few that can tolerate low. And that selection pressure that's changed is now favoring the, what, the corals that can tolerate higher temperatures so they're not, they don't bleach. Tawny owls in Finland have shown directional selection towards brown plumage due to the less snow. So again, it's shifted, the variation has shifted in one direction, so it's directional selection. And red squirrels in the southwest Yukon are giving birth earlier due to the availability of extra cones from spruce trees, which are producing more due to the drier environment. So all these knock-on effects from climate, changing selection pressures, uh, and shifting um, the way that organisms are evolving. Now, when a species disappears from the earth entirely, it is said to be extinct. Organisms at risk of becoming extinct are described as endangered. Now, the fossil record shows that actually 98% of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. Extinction is a normal process and it occurs at a rate of about one per one million species per year. This is what we call background extinction. However, extinction, extinction is happening at a much faster rate than that. In fact, it's currently at its highest rate it has ever been. And in tropical areas, the current rate of extinction is between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than background extinction rate. For example, a third of all marine fish rely on coral reefs, and at the moment, at the, at the current rate of destruction, half of the world's reefs could be lost within the next 20 years. So this is a frightening time, really, for species on planet Earth, and this graphic displays just how uh, biodiversity is being threatened at the moment. Now, when this happens, this is called mass extinction. We are currently in the midst of the biggest mass extinction of all time. There have already been five mass extinction events already, um, but this is the worst ever. This one is being caused by human activities, things like loss of habitat from deforestation, overhunting from fishing, competition from in introduced species like the grey squirrel, and then also pollution that's caused from our population, growing population, things like acid rain and pesticides. So, moving back to speciation, which was mentioned in part one of evolution, okay? This is the idea of how a new species can be formed. Let's go back to that and talk more about that in more detail. Now, populations are groups of interbreeding individuals. And within each population, you can have little subunits, breeding subunits called deems. Now, individuals within a deem tend to breed with each other, understandably, because they're in a population together. Now, speciation starts to occur when a deem becomes separated and the flow of genes between this deem and another deem stops. And if you don't have gene flow and they become isolated, they will start to probably change differently to the other population if the selection pressures are slightly different in each case. 
Now, any barrier that prevents long-term gene flow between DEMs is known as an isolating mechanism. Eventually, the new group accumulates so many differences, it would change so much that, uh, from the ancestral group that interbreeding could no longer occur if you brought these two individuals back together. There are two main forms of isolating mechanism. You can have what's called allopatric speciation. Now, this occurs due to geographical isolation. This is the main way that evolution occurs, really, through allopatric speciation. It's the most common type. There is also sympatric speciation. This occurs between populations of species living in the same place. So they're not isolated geographically, but other things can still separate them, sort of artificially, if you like. Things like mechanical um, isolation can occur, ecological, behavioral, or temporal isolation. We'll talk more about these different types of isolation in a minute. Okay. Now, in allopatric speciation, organisms evolve into two or more descendant species after a period of physical separation. It's usually caused by something geographical, something like a river, a rock slide, or a mountain range. You may remember from the first video, the antelope squirrel that got separated by the Grand Canyon. This is an example of allopatric speciation. What about this example? This is a great example here, frogs in the, in the Montan rainforest. Now, it all starts um, with uh, one continuous environment. You can see all the frogs there. There's one continuous environment in the mountains and lots of gene flow between them. They can all interbreed, lots of gene flow. But the climate warms up and the forest actually shifts to a higher elevation. It moves up and the frogs have to move with the, with the forest that they like. So they move up higher up the mountain ranges and they can no longer uh, um, get gene flow between them. They become geographically isolated and gene flow therefore stops. Natural selection occurs on each frog over a period of time due to Vossag, look back on video one if you can't remember that, all the different um, changes occur and uh, we get different species of frog. Now the climate can actually cool down and the forest can go back down its elevation back to where it was. But the organisms have now changed so much, they've evolved independently and they no longer can interbreed. We say new species have formed, speciation has occurred, allopatric speciation. Another example, uh, a really interesting specific example of this is, is ring species. Now the, uh, uh, the N. satina salamanders are an example of a ring species. Um, these organisms show variation due to being separated by distance, but adjacent populations can still interbreed. And there's small variations between these deems, but they can still interbreed, and they can interbreed with the next one, and the next one, and the next one. But you, because it's evolved down around uh, a geographical barrier, by the time those two extremes get to the other side, around the geographical barrier, and could te uh, technically meet up again, they've changed so much that they can no longer interbreed. Okay, so this is again is an allopatric speciation because of the changes that have occurred down both sides, around both sides of that geographical barrier in the middle, those two organisms at the bottom can no longer interbreed anymore. Okay, and this supports a lot of our ideas about natural selection. Another example of a ring species is the, the Laris gulls. Um, this range of gulls forms a ring around the North Pole and the lesser black-backed gulls, as shown at number one here, are sufficiently different after all the evolution that's occurred from the ones at number seven, who although they're now very close to each other, they, um, they can no longer interbreed, they're different species. Let's go back to those two types of species. Remember, we had allopatric, we had sympatric. So let's talk about sympatric now. Sympatric occurs between populations of species living in the same place. That can be caused by four different isolating mechanisms, as I mentioned. Temporal, ecological, mechanical, or behavioral. Okay, so what, is, what are these things? Well, temporal is, is to do with is basically seasonal isolation. Certain species are only able to reproduce at certain times. For example, certain flowering plants, the times of, of year that they flower. Now, if this timing shifts, then they could become isolated. So even though they're in not geographically separated, they might be flowering at different times and therefore, therefore can no longer interbreed. So that may occur. You might get ecological isolation. This is when individuals develop a preference for a particular part of the habitat and therefore don't mix anymore. There's no physical geographical barrier but in the way like a mountain range, but they just prefer one area to another. It might be mechanical isolation. This is when a mutation occurs which makes the animal gen genitalia physically incompatible. 
They might be different size, shape or location, or variations in flower structure, for example, may impede pollination. Or it could be behavioural. Things like mating rituals are very, very specific. If you've got a different mating ritual, if, if one bird is, is doing this and another one's doing this, then they're not going to uh, maybe uh, recognise each other. The ritual won't work and they won't mate anymore. So the mating rituals may shift. A couple of examples of sympatric speciation. A key one that's mentioned quite a lot are the, the cichlids in Lake Victoria. This is a huge big lake. Now cichlids are fish that belong to the cichlidae family. Um, the population in Lake Victoria in Africa have undergone rapid adaptive radiation. Remember adaptive radiation is when founder species arrive and they fit all these different ecological niches and so you get all different variations um, uh, existing. Okay, and so in this case, they've actually uh, formed 500 different species in less than 15,000 years, which in evolutionary terms is nothing at all. So it's formed 500 individual different species of cichlid. Okay, now the large variety uh, is due to many different niches available within Lake Victoria. It's such a big, such a big uh, lake. Uh, there's loads of different niches available, and so these cichlids have filled all these different niches. This is an example of sympatric speciation because of the mating preferences due to colour. So there are always different colours, they don't mate with each other because they're not the same colour. So the blue cichlids exist in the shallower water and the preference for blue cichlids is to mate with the other blue cichlids. Okay? Whilst the red cichlids are found in, in greater depths and they will mate with other red cichlids. So we've got all these different um, patterns occurring, sympatric speciation, different species occurring um, because of these different preferences. Let's look at a specific example of speciation and we'll look at resistance to antibiotics. It's a really current example of where speciation uh, is important. So let's just do a bit of a recap on, on antibiotics and uh, pathogens. Pathogens are living organisms that cause disease. And one of the biggest groups of pathogens are bacteria. Now various bacterial infections kill millions of people every year. Um, they, they, it was devastating until the first antibiotics were discovered and manufactured. Alexander Fleming discovered the first true antibiotic in penicillin in 1928 and it was mass produced uh, in the sort of 1940s and it saved millions of people's lives, absolutely millions. However, not long after that, by the 1960s, bacteria had evolved a resistance to penicillin. Bacteria can re reproduce every 20 minutes, so the process of natural selection happens really, really quickly. The bacteria had a mutation that allowed them to make an enzyme called penicillinase, uh, which breaks down penicillin. This gave them an instant selective advantage, rapid selective advantage. All the other bacteria were killed very, very quickly because of the antibiotics. The bacteria that can survive survive survival of the fittest and they pass on their genes they reproduce by binary fission so they pass on their genes every 20 minutes new population exponential growth and very quickly you've got a population of resistant bacteria now the challenge was therefore set by the bacteria so scientists then said well okay let's make a new antibiotic called methicillin however this didn't last long either and now we have a big issue in hospitals with stuff with a bacteria called methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus or mrsa this is an example of a superbug now superbugs have been caused by doctors over prescribing antibiotics giving them out too often giving them out for viral infections that antibiotics don't can't even help with Patients also not completing the course, so only taking it until they feel a little bit better and then stopping when they should need to carry on the course to make sure they've killed off every uh, last pathogen they've got. Um, or even overuse of antibiotics in the feed for farm animals. So there's lots of reasons why superbugs are evolving so much at the moment. Now the problem though is actually uh, worsened by the fact that resistance can evolve in one species of bacteria and be passed to another. Bacteria can actually do something called conjugation, and this is where they transfer plasmids, and quite often resistance mutation occurs on a plasmid. So one bacteria can then give its plasmid, exchange its plasmid via conjugation with another bacteria, and therefore that bacteria can develop resistance without ever even being exposed to the original antibiotic, to the original selection pressure. It can just get past it from another resistant bacteria. Vancomycin is the last line of defense for several diseases, but a completely resistant strain has been produced in the lab by conjugation. So there's not good news that that can happen. 
couple of other major superbugs you may have heard of, something called multidrug resistant TB, MDR-TB, occurs when uh, the bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculosis um, is resistant to the two of the most powerful first-line drugs that usually give people to treat tuberculosis. Or Neisseria gonorrhea, H041, is a resistant strain of the bacterium that causes the sexually transmitted disease gonorrhea. Um, which is resistant to something called uh, ceftriaxone. So as usual, there's some really good extension questions here for you to go and research to expand your knowledge on this topic.